Let's go, hurry up. I didn't finish my breakfast. Well, you should have gotten ready sooner. Mom, my glasses itchy. Honey, have you seen my glasses? Mom, she's pushing me. Knock it off, you two. He started it. No, I didn't. Everyone, just be quiet. We're late for church. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Are you doing well? Man, you are the flock that rocks. You guys are so awesome. And I looked around as I was coming in uh, today at this service and noticed a lot of Dallas Cowboy jerseys. And it really hurt my feelings. But especially, especially over here, we have like three generations uh, wearing. And the, the sad thing is, can you bring her down real quick, real, real quick? In fact, all three of you come here. This is not, this is really sad. <laughs> this is really sad because, um, we're, we're, yeah, we're going to talk about parenting today. And when you train up a child in the way that they should go, yeah, come on up here on the steps real quick. Look here. I, I couldn't believe it. I want you to see what I had to see before I came in here today. Hi, honey. Can you say hi to everybody? Can you say hi to everybody? Yeah. So you got... Three full generations and training up this poor baby to wear a Dallas cow. Yeah, now she sees herself in the monitor. Oh, she's all in it now. Anyways, so anyway, hey, I, I, I want to say thank you, but no, no. Hey, baby, they've deceived you. I just want you to know that, okay? Pastor James will be praying for you, all right? Okay, all right, let's give it up for him, guys. Come on. Wow, that's sad. So, we are talking about, uh, you know, perfect, uh, per uh, perfect families in this series, no such thing. Uh, last week, Liddy and I talked to you about putting joy back into our families. Today, I do want to talk to you about parenting. Now, some of you right now just said, wait a second, I can check out because I don't have, you know, kids at home. Wrong. How many of you uh, are grandparents? Can I see your hand? Any grandparents? Yeah. Uh, any of you have nieces and nephews? Any of you have brats next door, neighbors, <laughs> little rag muffins? Mm -hmm. The point is that children are a part of all of our lives, and how many of you want to be a part of changing the next generation? Yes? Yeah, we do. We want to make a difference. So we want to talk about um, uh, parenting today. And um, So let's start with the poll. How many of you are parents? Can I see? Raise up your hand. You're, you're a parent. I see that hand. God bless you. I see, I see that hand. God help you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Parenting is tough business. I remember when Jim and John were real small, my two sons, and, and, and you know, boy, they were so noisy. To be so small, they could make so, make so much noise. And, and, and I would just, Lord, can you just help them to not be so noisy? But then I realized one day, wait a second, little kids are like mosquitoes. When they stop making noise, that's not good. They're getting into something, you know. And, and have you noticed that parents, moms and dads, parent differently? Have you? Let me show you what I'm talking about. A, few, a couple pictures. Look up at the screen. Look how they're going to the, the, the zoo. Look at dad. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, shopping. Look at mama. Now look at daddy. Yep, yep, yep. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, mom, she's very concerned about, yeah, dad, he's all into it. Go to the next one. Yeah. Now, I love that one. That is so true. Yep. And one last one. There's mom, she's reading, then daddy's watching the video game. What? Anyway, let's move that one away. That child was bringing him something he ought not to be bringing. Anyways, <laughs> the truth is parenting can be so challenging and, and at times difficult, but how many of you would say that it could also be very rewarding? I've had people ask me through the years, James, what would, you be, what would you consider your greatest success? They always expect me to say something else, but my greatest success is the fact that I know that both of my sons, Jim and John, grew up to know and love God, that they married women who love God, and now they're raising their children to know and love God. To me, at the end of the day, that is real success. 
The opening verse talks about that, and I want you to read it with me, everybody, if you would. 3 John 1 and 4. Everybody ready? Ready? Yep. All right, let's go. Nothing gives me greater joy than to hear that my children are following the way of truth. Underline following the way of truth. Following the way of truth. Isn't that the number one priority of parents? We want to make sure that our kids are following the way of truth, that we're setting them up to win in this life, but also in the life to come. So for the next few minutes, here's what I'd like to do. I just want to have a parent practicum. I want to talk to you for a few minutes from God's perspective about what he, he thinks about, about parenting all the way, parenting all the way from the time they're born all the way until they leave home and go to college or whatever and, and, and we party, I mean, and cry as they walk out <laughs> the door. The first thing I think God would say to us is be a person of integrity. Be a person of integrity or character or honesty. You know why that's important? You know why that's vital? Because we teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. Let me say it again. We teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7 says this. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them, underline that, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, uh, when you lie down and when you get up. God says, listen, I want you to impress them on your children's hearts, these values, these convictions. But the only way I can impress them on, on my child's heart is if they've been impressed on my heart. But here's what I notice about kids. Kids are going to not follow what I say, I believe. They're going to follow what I do. They're going to follow my core convictions. In fact, this isn't in your outline, but two very important points about our integrity. Uh, let's put the first one up there. Uh, we need to be people of integrity because children will not follow our beliefs. They will follow our convictions. They will just imitate us. They will. I can say all day long, I believe this, but children around me are going to follow my behavior. It's like the little boy who was disciplined for losing his temper and his mama's getting on to him for, for getting mad. And he looks at his mama and he says, Mama, what's the difference between my bad temper and your worn out nerves? <laughs> have you noticed that kids have never been very good at listening to their elders? But they have never failed to imitate their elders. Some of us, we think the only time that our kids are like us is when they bring home straight-A report cards. Oh, that kid's just like me. <laughs> Not like his mama. Uh-uh, no, like me. But there's so many times, honestly, that, 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 that our kids would do things, and then they're not good. And we go, oh, acting just like his mama. I mean, just like me. <laughs> to this day, Jonathan can do things that will push my button. And when he does, I mean, he's 32. But he goes, ugh. And, and, and then I feel this angst, but then I go, he's acting just like me. This is the reason why we must choose to be people of integrity. There's another thing I want you to notice, and that is we need to be people of integrity because children do not rebel against authority. They rebel against what? Inconsistent authority. What does that mean? It means if, if I say this but do this, they rebel against that i got to be consistent in my authority. It's like the dad. Imagine with me. A dad, he finds out his, that his son is using drugs. And so he confronts his son and he says, Son, you, you told me you weren't into drugs. And now I find out you are in drugs. You're a liar. You're a liar. You know what the Bible says about that? The devil is the father of liars. All lies. And the, all liars have a part in the lake of fire. Man, he's just giving his son. Arr! All of a sudden the phone rings. The daughter picks it up. Says, hello. And the person says, hey, is your daddy there? And, and, and she, hey, dad, it's for you. And he's in the middle of this thing, you know. And all of a sudden, hey, it's for you, dad. And she, he says, hey, hey, can't you see I'm busy? Tell that guy, tell that guy I'm, I'm not here. I'm just not here. And then he goes back to, ah, all liars have the part in the lake of fire, boy. <laughs> Who's teaching that boy to be a liar? His daddy is. So we must begin with our own integrity as we raise our kids. The second thing is begin training early. Begin training early. Because here's the truth. You say they're my kids. They're really not. 
How many of you know we don't own our kids? Our kids are on loan to us from God. And from day one, our job is saying, okay, by the time they leave my home and under my care, I want to make sure that they're headed in the right direction. And we say that from day one. In fact, when I think of my sons, again, Jim and John, and how these days they're following Jesus, and both of them are, are serving God, and it, just, it makes my heart so warm. But, it, but the truth is, this is the truth, that Lydia and I, many, many years ago, before the kids were even born, sat down and made a decision. And we said, we're going to raise up our sons in the teachings of Christ and get them ready for the day when they leave home. And when Jim was born and then John was born, we began with the end in mind. We began saying one day we want them to leave home with a value system that is based in the Bible. And we want to make sure that they have a loving relationship with their God in heaven. We want to make sure that they can make their own good moral choices, that they can hear for, from God themselves. you got to begin early. Training early is everything. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Teach your children to choose the right path, not the Dallas Cowboys path over there. <laughs> hey, y'all. Teach your child to choose the right path, and when they are older, they will remain upon it. Now, again, ideally, some of you are just coming into faith, and I get that, but ideally, if you can begin that training early, that's the best way. Why? Listen, listen. Because when they, by the time they're three years old, their little character's already being developed. And by the time they're seven years old, their heart, the internal part of them, their, their spiritual heart, their value system, their core beliefs are shaped by seven years old. That's the reason why you have to begin early in life. Shape the values while they're young, and then when they grow up, yes, they'll stray away, but they're inclined to come back to those values and to those core convictions and teachings. Now, I have to talk about this because it's my job, and the Bible says it. Part of training includes correction. It does. includes correction. Proverbs 23, 13, 14, in the message paraphrase, oh, don't be afraid to correct your young ones. A spanking won't kill them. A good spanking, in fact, might save them from something worse than death. Now, I know it's controversial, and I know this weekend, out of six services, I'm going to get some emails. I get it. But I want to tell you right now, the Bible makes it clear, we've got to discipline our kids. And for some of us, it includes a spanking. That's why the butt is there. It's a smack. <laughs> never abuse, never out of anger. No, 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 no. It says that a spanking won't kill your child. Now, they'll make noises like they're dying. <laughs> I get it. You know, I just got to say it because I'm an old dude now. But I hear people, I'm going to give them another time out. Listen, you've given them 50 times out. Isn't that working? <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. You can send me emails, but I'm just saying. Our discipline, no matter how you choose to discipline as a parent, needs to always be out of love. Because the Bible says, who the Lord disciplines, excuse me, who the Lord loves, He disciplines. He disciplines because He loves us. And as parents, that's what we, we must do with our kids as well. Now, in today's message, I'm going to give you three quick New Life family stories of parents who are parenting their children at different stages. And, and the first one... Uh, is Rodney and Erica Moyer. They're actually in this service down front, yes. And anyways, they have little ones at home. You're going to like their story. Let's watch. One, two, three. We're the Moyer family! <laughs> What's your bear's name, Libby? Monkey! <laughs> Monkey bear. Your bear's name is Monkey? <laughs> As soon as we like, you know, start talking about, you know, disciplining and how good they are and stuff, they're gonna like just go crazy. That's I know. Why. I don't know if I figured what's gonna happen. <laughs> I think that Rodney and I both are on the same page that we really do want to um, 
teach both of our children to be good people. We want them to be respectful. We want them to not only be respectful of others, but to also be respectful of themselves and to treat themselves with respect as well. Part of us doing that and accomplishing that is making sure that Rodney and I are on the same page when it comes to discipline. I, I think for our family, um, just keeping the consistency there, it, it's very important. We've always tried to um, have a very consistent love for our children. I believe that the consistency in love, in showing it in discipline, and showing it in the fun times. Um, and I think that that's how our God is with us, is He's loving, and he, even, even in discipline, He still loves us, yeah. and we know that. Raising a family isn't easy. There's an manual for it. So even as parents, I think that it's important for us to be consistent and asking for help and being in prayer over our children. We just want to love them just the way that our Father loves us. We want to love them. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Banana! Banana! <laughs> First thing is to become a person of integrity, more of a person of integrity. The second thing God would say is this, become a lifelong friend to my child. Become a lifelong friend to my child. But some of you go right now, wait a second, James, you don't understand. My kid is doing things. There's no way I can be her friend. No way I can be his friend. Wait a second. How many of you know that you are friend, you're a friend of God? Yes? Yes? Okay. We're all friends of God. But how many of you would say that I'm not always perfect? Okay. I don't mean me, Lydia. Anyway, she's done. Amen. Preach it, brother. You're... No, here's what I'm saying. You're a friend of God. But yet you don't always do things right, right? But so you stay in a friendship with God. Here's what I'm saying. Your child, especially when they get in the teen years and on, needs you to stay in a friendship with them while still remaining a parent. Now, I have to make confession. I did not do real good at this one for a season of my parenting. My son Jim, when he was around 17 years old, was being very 17. I cannot tell you. Because I've been sworn to secrecy. No, I wasn't that bad. But he had attitudes, behaviors that were like, you know, he was driving me crazy. Oh, by the way, he was only doing things at 17 that I was doing when I was 17 that I drove my dad crazy. I reaped what I sowed. The good news is, is that Jim's oldest child is now 11. And I can't wait for the day. Oh, happy day when he gets up around 17. Caden is helping Jim to reap what he sowed with me. Anyway, so here's Jim. He's like, you know, got some stuff going on, driving me crazy as a parent. And one day I go up to him and I said to my son, and I thought it was so righteous, Jim, I just want you to know, son, you know I love you. I love you. But at this season of your life, I don't want to be your friend. I need to be your parent. Oh, I felt so good. That was the right thing to say. So I go to one of my mentors a month or two later and we told him what I said to my son. He said, James, that was dumb. <laughs> what do you mean that was dumb? He said, no, 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 that was really, really dumb. He said, because you need to, yes, be a parent, and yes, do discipline, all that kind of stuff. But at 17, he needs you to remain a friend to him because here's what he said it got me. And I'll never forget it. He said, because if you lose him as a friend at 17... You think you're going to circle back five, six, seven years down the road and do it? He said, mm. He says, a good chance. If you lose him as a friend at 17, you'll lose him as a friend permanently. OMG. I like, so I went back and I began to rebuild this friendship with my son while still remaining my parent role. And these days, 17 years later, Jim will tell you, he's still a good friend of mine. We're, we're buddies. Now, he does work for the church, works for me, so I happen to be dad and boss. So there's sometimes he'll just, you know, and, uh, but he's an awesome dude, and we're friends. Here's what I'm saying. Don't lose that friendship with your child, especially while they're going through those crazy spells. The Bible says this. Proverbs 17, 17 in the message paraphrase, it says, Friends love through all kinds of weather. Read the rest with me out loud, ready, go. And families stick together in all kinds. Families what? 
We stick together through everything. We're going to keep a friendship. I want you to meet another family in our church uh, who happens to be uh, my number one nemesis as a Dallas Cowboys fan, and that's Casey. I mentioned her last week. But anyways, it's her and her family, and she has teenagers. Watch the screens. Oh, I'm Kaden. I'm Casey. I'm Chris. And I'm Cash. And, and we're, we're the, the Brooks family. family. I would say from starting even from a young age, we just started with communication and building a relationship yeah. with them. And all, we're always with them. We always do everything together. From a young age, we just kind of built that up. And then as they've gotten older, we have kept that communication very open. We're very much a part of their life. We do everything together. We do football games together on Friday nights. We go to BC football game on Saturday nights when it's, you know, when it's football season, you know, football is obviously our thing. But other than that, we do, we have old cars, so we take them out and we cruise together. Just growing up, you know, I've always been super close to them and I've always been like, been able to be open about them. They've accepted me, they encourage me, like in all that I do, like everything is always gonna be okay and, you know. This is fun. And we're super cool. <laughs> and they're cool. <laughs> I honestly like it only because like not a lot of parents are like that. And to have parents like that, it's pretty cool. I feel like the most important part is the communication part. You know, be be present in their life, communicate with them constantly. Um, kind of almost build like a, a, not a friendship, but kind of like a friendship with them. Um, Cause you want that trust. You want them to trust you to know that they can come to you. But you have to set that up when you they're young. You have to set young, those boundaries. When they're young. And again, on. just being there for them all the time. Super, being super present in their life is so important. Yeah. The main thing that happens in this house besides dancing are selfies. Like these two are like the selfie <laughs> Not my, queens. Don't point at me. And then you've got this guy. Don't point at who me. Who can't take a serious picture at to save all. his life. At all. Okay, you put ready? your arms up and twist it. There you go. Ready? There. Bye. 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 Go Cowboys. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the truth. All mentoring, all discipleship, all parenting is based on relationships. And if you keep the relationship going, especially during the tough times, it makes it easier to have those tough conversations down the road. It makes it easier when you've got good relationships to talk about the tough issues of life, to confront the tough issues of life. You've got to keep the relationship. Now, here's what I know about your family. I know about mine. And that is that every family has a season where a child will do something that is dumb, will do something that's embarrassing, that your child, my children, are going to do things, some of you are looking at them right now, that's not nice. Okay, mom, stop. They are. They're going to, they're going to drift away sometimes from the, the things that we've taught them growing up. What do you do when your child strays? And I'm basically talking about preteen all the way through 50 years old or whatever it may be. There are three things you need to keep. You may want to jot them down. To keep this friendship going, to, to, when they stray away from the teachings and what you've taught them. Number one, keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. Now, my mama is a praying woman. She is. Margaret Ranger prays all the time. I want you to see the picture of her. It's up on the screen right now. The two ugly guys on the side, they don't matter. But that woman in the middle, that's a godly woman. Mama has always prayed for me, still does. And I remember when I was about 12 years old, shouldn't tell you this story because you'll never look at me the same again. I was 12 years old and uh, living in St. Paul, Minnesota, a very legalistic church we were involved in. And, and I remember one night I was out hanging out with the wrong kind of friends and they were drinking a lot. So I drank with them. A lot. I got drunk. Twelve years old. My daddy's a preacher. I hold my friend's house. It, 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 it wasn't pretty. Anyway, so I get a phone call. And it's my sister Melody. And she said, hey, dad heard that you're over your friend's house and you're drinking. 
He's looking for you. He just left the house. You better get home now. Oh, my gosh. So I staggered home and went up in my bed, you know, and pulled the blanket up here and pretended I was asleep. <laughs> so when Daddy came home, he wouldn't, you know, whoop me. And as I laid there in bed, it was quiet. All of a sudden, next to me is my mama's bedroom, and I heard her talking. She wasn't just talking. She was talking loud. Now, listen, she's talking to Jesus about me. She did. She, she's saying, Jesus, you know, Jimmy, he's out there sinning right now, Lord. I'm not kidding. And Holy Spirit, sick him. Holy Spirit, sick him. I can't be where he's at, but you can. Sick him, Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh, my gosh. She's sicking the Holy Ghost on me. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And as I later it pierced my heart, it was like, oh, my gosh. You're, hearing your mom pray for you is there's nothing like it in the world. I mean, dad was okay, but when mom prays for you, it's a different deal. And, and it pierced my heart. And then when dad came home, he, didn't ta- he, didn't, he, he knew I wasn't faking. And, and he pierced my ears, not this, but with his words. Then he spanked my butt anyways. <laughs> Here's what happened to me. That night, something changed in my heart. It didn't happen immediate, but within about two or three months, I had a transformation in my life, brought me to faith in Jesus at a very profound level at 13 years of age, and I can make the direct connection to that prayer that night that I heard my mama pray. So listen carefully. Never, ever underestimate the power of a praying mother or praying father, or grandparent. Listen, there's power in our prayers. When your kids stray, keep praying for them. Sick the Holy Spirit on them. (laughs) You can't be with them 24-7, but the Holy Spirit is. That'd be your new prayer. Sick them, Holy Spirit. (laughs) The second thing, the second thing we need to do is to keep the door open and the light on. When your kids stray... And then they decide to come back home. They need to know there's unconditional love, acceptance, and forgiveness waiting for them. It's another family I want you to meet right now. It's the Williams family, and they have a a lot of kids. But they have some adult children that they parent as well. Let's watch. Hi, we are the Williams family. We have six kids. Uh, ages 33 to 13, so we have our hands full, stretched. Actually, we had all six in the house at one time, uh, along with three foster children. So that was uh, very interesting. So our adult children uh, have not always been uh, perfect like their mother, and they have strayed off and done their own things, uh, contrary to our Uh, guidance and um, input. Even though we've had disagreements, even though we've not seen eye to eye on things, we've always like said at the end of the day we're team. You know, and everybody has a different role on the team and different personalities, but they still belong to the team. And I think that's what's kept us doing so well with our adult children. We've made some mistakes and uh, we didn't always have the right answers. We thought we were doing the right thing, Uh, but I found out early on, I got a good piece of wisdom, and it was this, that you need to develop the relationship with your children when they're 15 and 16 as to the type of relationship you want to have with them when they're 25 and 26. To really respect them as people and just see them as not just your children, but as a, a person, and their personality and just to really relish that and they know things and they know what they want to do in life and it might not look like what I want and I have to be okay with that. Well I do know this that I offered my advice to them once they turned 18 and a majority of the time they turned it down. Uh, Talking about building that relationship right around age 23, 24, 25 they started calling back and asking for advice again. You got to keep the door open and keep the light on. Jesus one day told the story about a father and a son. Talked about how this son 
came of age and he decided one day to demand his inheritance from his daddy. Dad, I want my inheritance now. I know you're not dead, but I want my money now. Dad said, okay. So there he left the home and he went off to the big city. I want you to notice what the father did not do. Listen up. The father did not chase after his son. Some of you are chasing after adult children. You're being codependent. You're trying to chase them down. You're trying... Listen, that father knew that there's certain things that are learned only through life and th through turning your adult child over to the care of God. Sometimes only pain is going to teach them. That father did not chase after him. Also, I want you to notice that the father realized that I, it's a new season in my life with this son of mine. I used to be responsible for him. I'm no longer responsible, responsible for him now. I'm responsible to him. Listen up. There's a time in your life, as a two-year-old, yes, you're responsible for them. But as a 20-year-old, you're not responsible for them. You're responsible to them. This father understood that he had to turn his son over to the care and the control of God. He knew that he had deposited the values and the teachings in his son's life. Now the son's going to have to make his own faith decision himself. So the boy goes off to the big city and he's got all this money and he spends it all on wine and women. Sound vaguely familiar? Mm -hmm. Spends all of his, all the inheritance. He hits rock bottom. He finds himself so hungry that he goes to work for a pig farmer. Not a good thing for a good Jewish boy. And he finds himself eating with the pigs, pig slop. And he comes to his senses because he, listen, because he hit bottom. His parent let him hit bottom. Some of you, you got to let that kid, I'm not talking about a three-year-old. You may have to take care of a bottom, but <laughs> adult kids, you got to let them hit bottom. And that sometimes means them eating with the pigs. And the kid comes to his senses and he says, wait a second. I can go back to my dad's house and I'll be a slave because as a slave, at least I'll get, you know, three meals a day and a, and a roof over my head. So he makes up this story, what he's going to tell his dad, and he starts this long trek back to dad's house. And in the one, one of the most moving scenes in the entire Bible, here is this, this prodigal son. He's coming back. You know, he's got his head down, and he's a long ways from the house, but all of a sudden he looks up, and his dad is running after him. He looks up, and his dad is running, and here's dad, you know, and all of his, his royalty and all of his splendor. He's running, and he grabs his son, and he begins to kiss him all over his face. It's caked by dust and caked by pig slop and he's kissing. Mmm, I missed you. I love you. And the son's going, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me apologize. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I know you're sorry. Come on home. I'm throwing a party for you tonight. We're, we're going we're gonna to celebrate. I'm going to give you a robe and here's the ring and welcome home, son. The dad didn't sit up on the porch and say, oh, come on, son, just grovel back. Get on your knees and beg forgiveness. Didn't do that. What did he do? He kept the door open. He kept the light on. There was unconditional love when the son finally made the turn. Here's my question. Listen, here's my question to you. Do your kids know unequivocally that there's unconditional love for them? Yes, I have to set up boundaries for an adult child. And yes, I got to let them go to the big city and spend whatever and do what they're going to do. But they do... Do they know that I love them? And when they make the turn and they come to their senses, they can come home to love. That brings me to the last point, and that's simply this. You've got to keep expressing love. Keep expressing love. Keep the love being told. You've got to tell it. You've got to show it to your child. Because, oh, by the way, isn't that how God loves you? We're going to come to Holy Communion in just a second, but I want you to catch this. Everybody look up here just a second. Look up here. Because some of you are there right now. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you, so listen. 
Some of you, your heart, you, you're like a prodigal child. You're a child of the Father. You've put your faith in God in the past, but you have drifted so far from your faith. You feel so distant from God. And for some of you, you've done some things that you feel are unforgivable or you're filled with shame and you'd like to come back to Father's house. I want you to hear the Lord say to you today, you're always welcomed home. The door is open. The light is on. And I hear Jesus say to you today, Come home. Come home. I still love you. I've not given up on you. You've given up on yourself, but I've not given up on you. Thank you, friend, for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed the message, and I hope it inspired you to be all that God's intended for you to be. Now, I suspect there's some of you that are watching this that uh, you've got to make things right with God today to find this relationship with Jesus Christ, with God, through His Son. And I, I know this, that God wants to bring you life. He wants to bring you forgiveness of your sins, and, and He wants to show you how to live now, and He wants to give you everlasting life in heaven someday. So if that's you, I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with me right now. Right where you're at, just say something like this from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, as best as I know how, I turn my life over to you, to your care and to your control. Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my heart and apply your precious blood to my heart, that my sins will be forgiven, that I will have purposeful living, and that I will have the hope of everlasting life in heaven. I receive this free gift of everlasting life in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I wanna encourage you to go to our website nlc.life and uh, get all the information that you need about our church. God bless you.